I'll have to think of an introduction. I never write down any questions beforehand. That's always been my style, really. So three, two, one. Ding, ding, ding. Noah Braden, welcome to tonight's show. You're the second creator I've talked to on Creator Spotlight. And so I knew you. Uh, I knew I was paying attention to your work a few months ago. And suddenly I was looking back at your work and you've surpassed me by far, even though I've been in the YouTube uh, realm for almost a year now. And so I'm interested to learn those secrets. Uh, so hopefully by you explaining those, those can help other people as well, other creators. And yeah, I'm just interested to know your backstory. How did you get into content creation? Why did you want to start doing that? And so you were a part of a production company. Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, no, thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and happy to be talking about some of my favorite things to talk about. I like to talk in general, but uh, as you can probably imagine, right, you know, you don't really start a podcast and start a YouTube channel unless you at least like to talk a little bit too much. Um, sure. I've halfway joked that I started a podcast because uh, my wife got tired of hearing me talk. She approved that <laughs> joke. So um, it's it's uh, it has her approval. But um so how did I get started in media and production in general? So I actually started out as an English major in undergrad, uh, went the creative writing route and specialized both in fiction and script writing as my two um, like particular focuses within my major. So as a result of that, and as well as I was only a credit shy of um, a minor in film, just because of something that's always fascinated me, I've always loved stories, whether it's written stories, whether it's uh, stories in film, um, really stories of any fashion, if they are compelling, uh, human first stories that actually, you know, capture the heart or, um, you know, those, yeah, really of any format. So I grew up in that environment uh, and I grew up in a family of artists. Um, so that's probably a relevant uh, backstory detail. But uh, in terms of my professional focus, I started out my career as a journalist before switching very quickly into uh, content marketing. So advertorial copywriting uh, started out for real estate features and stuff like that. So very uh, unimpressive uh, journalistic writing, but kind of just slugged my way through a lot of really bad stories uh, for long enough and started to get a couple of better ones. And, you know, just kind of worked my way up to the point where yeah. um, a few years in or about five, I guess, you know, three or four years into uh, that job, that was for a Chicago based content production company. I was working as their copy chief. So I was basically managing um most of their of their features and all of their advertorial copy uh, at that point for a variety of clients across the country. Um, so at that point, I was effectively producing content, uh, but everything but video. So I was managing writers, editors, designers, uh, web developers and the like, uh, but no video at that point because it was mm -hmm. entirely it was the print world. It was like the print world when it was just it was it was switched to digital, but in the fledgling kind of digital stage. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was weird. Like I started out my career largely in the remote capacity. Um, so I've been remote, like before it was, uh, before it was the popular thing, uh, <laughs> as a writer. So when the world shifted into the remote thing, I was, I was ready. I was, uh, I was excited about that. So yeah, at that point I, I was, you know, managing, uh, a team of content producers, uh, basically every, every form of new media except for video, uh, and I say that because it was a natural segue into my time working in video production. So at that point, uh, I met who uh, a guy who became or actually I reconnected with a guy who became my business partner. We co-founded a media agency called Motivo Media. It's still in operation. Um, it's now based in Seattle. That's where my business partner uh, was based out of. And we started that together. So effectively, he was someone who had a ton of connections and a large network within the video world. And he was approached with a project that was too big for him to manage by himself. So he needed a producer who had an eye for operations and scalability to kind of come in. Well, we didn't know that last part. So I'm sort of giving away the ending. But he needed someone to help him manage the project. So he approached me um, and was like, look, you're a producer. Like, I know you haven't done video, but like, I need someone to help me manage this project. It's the same thing. I mean, I'll handle all the video particular stuff on set. Can you do everything else? Basically manage pre-production, manage post-production. And it was shockingly similar to what I'd already been doing because in some sense, producing media is producing media, right? It's just different yeah. form of media. There's a lot of similarities. There's creative project management, right? So... 
I say that because it was a natural fit. So he approached me with a project uh, that was actually originally just for production. And I said, Hey, I'd love to do it. I'd love to, you know, partner with you in this, but let's pitch them for the entire production. So what turned, <laughs> so what was like a very small, like, Hey, we need someone to come in and do production, like actually just produce it on set. I'm talking about like in the technical sense of the onset days, the shooting and, yeah. you know, the gaffing, the grip, you know, all the kind of like the crew, yeah. Um, the crew work and, um, and so I said, but let's pitch them on, you know, let's pitch on the, the entire project. Like we can do this entire thing. We can go from pre-production into post and the entire thing. Uh, so we, we pitched them on a six figure project and we oh, formed wow. an LLC to take it and we got it. Um, like we literally formed an LLC to take it. We only had one client, one project, but it was a two year project, basically. Like it was a two year, six figure project and we built a company around it. Um, and at that point I dove headfirst into producing full time. So I produced full time, predominantly documentary content, branded docs, story driven doc style, you know, commercial projects. So, um, you know, I did a, a, a series for, for Amazon, for, you know, Alexa, um, featuring people who had actually benefited from the Alexa project. Long story short, um, you know, as a result of this project, you know, launching our LLC, and then we quickly got a couple more clients and then started to build a company around that. And I was very quickly uh, full-time in production. So about six months later, I quit my other job. Um, and I did that for about seven years. Okay. So then I ran my company uh, that I, that I co-founded. I ran that company with my partner for, for five years. And then about a year and a half ago, I let him buy me out. So I, I left the company to focus uh, more on, well, a lot of my Catholic related work, to be honest with you. So a conversion happened in that period. I converted to Catholicism about three years ago. Um, I enrolled in grad school at Notre Dame about two years ago. Uh, so I had these sequence of events kind of building up to what very much was a, was a shift in my own priorities. So we had a very amicable exit. Motivo is still alive and uh, thriving. It's Motivo Media, if anyone wants to look it up. Uh, it's a Seattle-based company, but uh, most of our clientele was uh, in DC. So with a lot of education mm -hmm. work, think tank work, branded docs. That's usually who's paying for branded docs, if you ever mm -hmm. want to get into branded docs. Um, it's usually DC-based think tanks and nonprofits who have grants. I don't know if that's useful information for, for creatives here, but uh, it might be. Yeah, for sure. I'd say. And so, yeah, like my next question would be, so getting into YouTube, you started yeah. the YouTube channel a couple of years ago, maybe like you had some kind of projects on there, but then it kind of transitioned into your Catholic videos. Yeah. So you've been putting those out for the last month. You started last few months, you started the podcast and all that have been interviewing some of the Catholic creators like Michael Lofton, uh, Kyle Whittington, yeah, so, yeah, most yeah. most recently, yeah, I've I've had a, a handful of them, and um, yeah, it was it was it's great. So I had Austin Suggs on as well from Gospel Simplicity um, a couple months mm -hmm. back, and uh, Gary Machuda as well. Um, so yeah, so the YouTube thing. So I had been producing content for quite a while that ended up living on YouTube. It was just for clients' channels. So don't think necessarily that I just entered YouTube a couple months ago, like as a brand new to YouTube thing. I think that yeah. would be something that might make people unnecessarily <laughs> discouraged. Um, and I don't think that that's a fair representation. So I had been involved in content that was being optimized for YouTube for a long time. I mean, a lot of these branded docs would actually live on YouTube. Um, and I was involved not only in the production of these con of this content, but also in the marketing of it uh, and in the advertising of it. So I would run ad budgets for, yeah. for videos and stuff. So I have an unfair advantage in terms of my, my background and experience. And like, um, so it's, it's definitely one of those things where I, I, in some ways I wish I had kind of gotten into it in a bigger way sooner because I waited until I was completely confident in my ability to do it, to, to enter it. And I regret that. So I think if anyone's listening, I think actually my, my, my one regret with YouTube is actually wish I had entered earlier. I think that would have been smarter because I wish I had gotten through those first 20 videos, which are the most painful or whatever number it is. That's somewhat arbitrary, but that first 10, 20, 30, 50, whatever videos it is, sure. like get through those as fast as you can. And I don't mean like literally as fast as you can, like pump out terrible content, but like do as well as you can and improve 
on one or two things every video as you go. But like the the goal there at that beginning, I think, is iterate as fast as you can and try to find your uh, I mean, I don't know if this has been coined by someone else, but like your minimum viable production or your minimum viable product. Right. Like that's the kind of that's definitely not my term. Like that's the the sales economics term, right? Your minimum viable product that you get. But like in this case, we're like looking almost like what's your minimum viable production that will help your channel grow. So maybe it's short content, but sometimes short content can be deceivingly hard because it requires more hefty edits, right? Whereas long form content that's live stream based could actually be a lot easier if you're comfortable talking live or if you sound terrible live, like you need to edit your stuff. And, and so there's all these like kind of like intersecting priorities and, and, and there's tension and trade-offs between them. And there's not really a right answer other than to find that piece of content that you can build your brand around. Or pieces of content. I just like to simplify because I think sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, I have to have like live streams and videos and shorts. And it's like, well, yeah, sort of. But like, think about your one core piece of content. That's your pillar content, right? And then you can make short form content from it. So if it's live streams, like great, awesome. Then do short summary videos that you edit from the live streams and then chop those up into shorts. So it's all focused on the live streams, right? And then it's just two mm -hmm. separate edits down, um, you know, from it. But whatever, whatever that is, or if you hate live streams, like if that's a terrifying thought, because sometimes it is for people like genuinely. Um, and I'm someone who had to overcome a terrible amount of anxiety for public speaking. So like, believe, mm -hmm. believe me, like I, I get it. Like if someone's out there like, and they're just like terrified by the prospect, I mean, I would be like uncontrollably like sweaty before these types of things. And I would just like have like, yeah, the nerves would be firing. So like, I completely understand it. And I think that's another reason yeah. to get through those first videos first 50 videos as soon as you can i've upped the number to 50 now <laughs> um but i think that's probably a better number right because i mean what do they say like that whole you gotta be ten thousand hours of of whatever thing to actually become a master at it like yeah i'm an over planner right like i wanted to have the perfect video at the beginning right like even if no one would see it like i wanted it to be perfect from the get-go no one's gonna resent you for the fact that you have bad content like if like especially if you're improving and growing i mean they might resent if you always have bad content but that they yeah. will <laughs> <laughs> yeah because like a lot of youtube is really knowledge and so mm. just getting out there and doing it you learn from that absolutely and so there's no way that the algorithm is random people will blame it on that they say oh the algorithm <clears throat> is the reason i'm not succeeding but do you have um any advice for those people what's the one thing they can do perhaps like the thumbnail or title What's the one thing they should focus on to really get their content um, out there to make it engaging content? Mm. What's the secret there? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I actually don't think, I mean, I have someone who has derided, unfairly perhaps derided the, uh, the algorithm before uh, in the past, but you're right. Um, you're right, Michael. It's not out to get you. The algorithm actually, if you know how to harness its power, wants to work with you in the sense that, your goals can be aligned with it. It's not that it's actually out to help you. It's actually out to help viewers stay on YouTube. <laughs> so what it wants is for people to continue to consume content on YouTube. So it cares about a couple different things. It cares about viewer engagement in on your content, but it also cares about what people do after they watch your content. Are they clicking away and leaving YouTube? That will actually work against your favor. Whereas if they are clicking onto other content, whether your videos in a playlist or other suggested content, and they stay on YouTube, that will actually be valued in your favor, like in your content's favor, and they'll start feeding it to more people. So they want people to consume content on YouTube. The algorithm wants that. Like, so that's the good news for everyone. YouTube wants people to watch YouTube videos. They don't care if it's a no-name creator or if it's, you know, whoever your, you know, 10 million subscriber kind of person you follow is, right? Um, they really don't because they just want people to stay on YouTube and watch YouTube videos. So that's the good news. Like there's no real gatekeeper. Like it is actually equal access in a sense. Now, I say in a sense, because as you build up subscribers, this becomes much easier because as you build up subscribers, it's fed to more people into their libraries, right? So those initial views are much easier to find. So it's easier to get that initial traction, right? So there mm -hmm. is a little bit of the, like, you just have to, it's a slog for a while, right? Like there is a little bit of that. Like the first challenge is building enough of an audience to get recurring views right in a sense mm -hmm. because once you start getting those recurring views you can count on 50 per video you can count on 100 per video and not just like five or 10 or, or whatever it is 
whatever that baseline is and don't and don't beat yourself up if it is 50 like that could be a great goal like but you get 50 for all of them and then you get 100 for all of them and then start working on that that can actually be a better measurement of success sometimes than whether one video gets a thousand and one video gets a hundred now i say that as someone who has great disparity in views on my videos so like i'm not saying this is like a problem right i have some videos that have thousands of views and some videos that have like 70 views like i have all over the place um mm -hmm. did i answer your question i hope i did um yeah for sure I'd say, but yeah, like talking more about your content, you've been uh, consistent. I think that's another huge thing. You've mm -hmm. talked about like the importance of playlists or suggestions. And so when people watch one of your videos, they like it. They'll then continue to watch your videos. And so I think yeah. that's something that has really played in your favor. Every video has been consistent. And so I think that comes from your background, of course, having the knowledge and all of that. And so... Yeah, like just the content you make, good Catholic content. Has there been a favorite video so far? Uh, the favorite video by by my like for for me or for the audience? I'm curious. Yeah, uh, that you enjoyed making. Yeah, um, I mean, honestly, this most recent one that I did, where I I pushed myself to edit a little bit more, and I added a couple little shots of B roll, which is very much outside of my wheelhouse as someone who's a writer and producer focused, right? Like, it's not like all filmmaking is created equal. Like, yes, I can kind of, op I can operate a camera, but like, I'm not a camera operator. Like I would not hire myself out to a client as such. Right. So it's, it's sort of a very different world. So I just say that because sometimes people I think, think like, Oh, you're a producer. Like you do everything. It's like, well, <laughs> not necessarily. So anyways, um, so I guess I can answer that in a couple different ways. I really enjoy interviewing people. So I, was fortunate enough to be a producer and director of documentaries, as I mentioned before. And as a result of that, I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people. So that occurred during pre-production that occurred on camera during production um, in all sorts of different ways, right? The research stage, as well as the production stage on camera. But, you know, but then at that point I was, I was safely behind the camera and like off screen, right. Asking mm -hmm. people questions and my voice wasn't heard. So it was interesting. So I was very comfortable though with interviewing people and I'm a curious person and I love having the opportunity to have dedicated focused conversations. It's a, it's a real value to me. Like I, I view it as a, as a true value. Um, so I love, yeah, I love being able to interview people. So it, in one sense, I would have to say that like all of my interview content on the it's noble podcast series would be my favorite just because I've learned from other people. And it seems almost like unfair that I get to have these great conversations. People actually listen to them and it helps my YouTube channel grow. And I'm like, I'm just having these conversations I want to have with these people that I want to talk to. And I, I, and I mean that, I don't mean that flippantly. I think there's actually some, something to extract from that. I think the more closely you can align your brand with something that you are already passionate about, the better off you're going to be. So VidIQ, right? That's a, they have a free version. I actually recommend everyone, everyone get it. Um, they also have a paid version if you want to go further, but VidIQ at the very least, I would recommend everyone who has a YouTube channel sign up for their, for their free version. It will give you a lot more analytics than YouTube studio can provide. Yeah, um, I'm taking, taking notes myself here. Yeah, no, no, definitely, definitely do that. Um, and uh, actually I had watched their videos for quite a while and taken some of their advice, but it was actually Braden cook, uh, the catechumen who, uh, recommended I subscribe to them. And I thought it was only a paid service, but it's actually a freemium model and their free service is quite good. Um, so I haven't upgraded to the, to the paid version. Um, they give you uh, keyword suggestions. They give you title suggestions. Now I haven't used these yet. So I haven't like seen the results of this applied. So that mm -hmm. being said, I've used a lot of the same underlying strategies because I've followed their content and other similar things. So um I recommend it. I mean, I think it will teach people, especially people who are brand new to it, will benefit the most from it. But I think people at any stage would benefit from some of it, right? Like you might learn something about mm -hmm. thumbnails. You might learn something about titling, um, you know. But uh, one of the biggest things that they recommend, I think the number one thing that they recommend, they kick off the whole um, sort of course. And it's an interactive. There's a gamify. There's a they've gamified um, the system. So you know how Duolingo has like, you know, kind of tracks your progress and all that kind of stuff. They've yeah. done, they've done something similar. So you can learn, you know, do a learning lesson each day, you know, kind of deal. But the thing that they lead off with is that passion is the most important thing. And of course I rolled my eyes. Cause it's like, ah, cheesy. Like, of course everyone says that, right. It's like the, the creative thing, like gotta be passionate and like real and authentic, like those buzzwords, but they're not wrong. Like it's, it's, it's true. It really is. And the reason it's true is because, 
if you're not passionate about what you're talking about and about what your content is focused on, you will absolutely burn out in under the weight of all of the stuff that you don't enjoy doing. Like there's a lot of tedious stuff related to YouTube, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe you enjoy some of it. You pro hopefully you do enjoy some of it. Like otherwise you're going to have an even harder time, but chances are you're not going to enjoy all of it. Like I, I love producing. I love creating stuff, but it's still tedious, right? I mean, the, the writing, the ideas, the, the thumbnails, the testing, the back end, the sharing. I mean, it's, it's a lot. And that's just for one video. And you have to do that constantly. Just keep doing it like a cycle, you know? And yeah. um, if you're not passionate about the content that you're producing, like about why, you know, if you don't have a real passion driving it, I think you will. I think people will burn out. I think it's just, it's inevitable. I really do. Um, and that's why I think to answer your other question, I think maybe or something that you mentioned earlier, um, mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned my shift into into the Catholic world, and uh, I think one of the keys to my success has absolutely been focusing very much on a particular type of audience member. Now, it's not exclusively Catholic, but it's definitely a Catholic leaning, ecumenically minded, um, philosophy thinking theology group of people. And I, and I know I kind of like mentioned a lot of things, but and that's hyper niche, and that's good. Like if you want to build content, go hyper niche, unless you are already famous and people want to watch you because you're, you know, Michael, Michael Snellen, the whole, is it Snellen or Schnellen? I want to yes, say Snellen. Okay. Uh, I German, say German, last thing. German because I took German. I want to, I want to say like Schnellen because it's like, <laughs> like that's probably you know, the correct way, but it probably is like the older way, but Snellen. Okay. Yeah. It's like, unless it's like, they want to watch Michael Snellen because it's Michael Snellen telling them that then you're going to have to convince people that it's worth watching. Mm -hmm. So people want to know, this is probably one of the biggest low hanging fruits. People want very clear. People want their expectations to be set very quickly when they land on your channel. And then they want their expectations to be met by the other content they see on your channel. So if you get so lucky as to capture the interest of someone with one video, right? And then they go visit your channel, maybe because they're not going to just subscribe. Chances are they're not going to subscribe on that video. Chances are what they're going to do is go to your channel page. That's usually the user journey. Yeah. So this is really important. This is why those th um, this is why the home page is so important. This is why that banner is so important. You're you're about that. Well, the first line of your about because that's really all that's going to show is like that first line of your about, and they need to be able to tell from that banner and that first line of your about what your channel is about. Like, is it even worth checking it out? And then they're going to want to look at that first video, your intro video, whatever, whatever that channel trailer is. And mine's yeah. not great. It really isn't. Um, it was one of the ones I did early on. I, I say, um, a lot. I don't edit it out enough, but it's very clear about what the channel is about. I will say, like, if there's something good about what my channel intro is, is it tells exactly how I started the channel, how I shifted the channel to focus, what you can expect on the channel, how there's playlists below, what those playlists contain. So like, and then in the description section, I have all those playlists linked. Yeah. So you don't even have to scroll down once they're also on my homepage, the least my favorite playlists are on my homepage. So you could scroll down and just do it, or you don't have to, you could just watch my, my main video. And if you see it on the homepage, that description will show up on web on uh, on your web browser at least not on mobile but um, on web browser that description will show up to the right of that channel intro video on your homepage so they'll see those playlist links right there so they can watch that for a minute or two get tired of the intro video it doesn't even matter because all they have to do is want to click on that intro on that playlist yeah and remember the yeah. algorithm right the algorithm wants people to stay on YouTube. Like they, they don't care if it's your content or someone else's. They just want them to stay on it. So, um, so I think that's why I would just really, it, it's, it's not like an, any one thing. I think a lot of it's understanding how the user journey impacts your, your channel and why these things matter. I think that's maybe something that will help a lot of people is understanding why, you know, why does that channel intro matter? Like why yeah. does the banner know? Because people want to know what your channel is about. They will not look at all of your video titles to see. You have not earned that time from them. Because remember, people are hyper protective of their time. Like that's perhaps the thing that we're most, we have, and we have no attention span. So you have to basically show someone in like, a second and a half what your channel is about and then generally they need to be able to expect you know see content from your channel and be like yeah that's kind of what i expected mm -hmm. not exactly it doesn't have to be like in gory detail but like 
um yeah if you want to really boost your your um the algorithm and kind of lean into that and get recommended to more people who are likely to do it it's that combo of catching their attention with the one video so that's where the thumbnail comes in that's where the title comes in because they're not going to click on that one video if they don't have a thumbnail and a title that is mm -hmm. and then that one video has to be good enough so I recommend also sometimes using particular videos as your like marketing flagship videos because not all your videos are probably going to be as good as some of them, right? It's just, it's hard yeah, to. Of course. So, so find one that really resonates with people. And a good testing thing is like, is it performing well organically? Like, are you seeing a lot of like organic performance? Um, and, and so if like one video is performing well, maybe you use that one to share on your other social media platforms. Maybe use that one to like, lead off maybe use that one to show you know on your homepage how you can set uh the video for recurring visitors mm -hmm. like people who are already subscribed maybe that's the one you have shown for them so whenever they're coming back because remember think about the user who doesn't know you they saw your video maybe you convince them to subscribe and then a month later they see your video they're like wait who is this and so they're fed that next video so if that video is good enough then they might you actually might start to get someone that wants to see your videos who starts to really like care because a subscriber is valuable but it's not like necessarily equating to people consuming all of your content voraciously either so it, it's a weird thing kind of how it all meshes together yeah so very knowledgeable and so you've only been doing this for a few months on paper really uh catholic youtube videos but you have this wealth of knowledge yeah i've so only been doing it for myself for a couple of months yeah i just had to do it for other people were paying me to do it before <laughs> yeah and so um yeah the enjoyment there that's the other thing that really sticks out to me just mm, your enjoyment yeah. of this and so i don't expect you to burn out anytime soon so yes thank you for joining the show and really spreading this knowledge with everyone i'm sure a couple of different people will be inspired to maybe join youtube or some of the catholic youtubers will be able to learn the youtube knowledge better and really spread the gospel so that's what it's all about we are all part of the same army spreading the gospel so thanks again noah and may god bless everyone oh it's my pleasure michael thank you so much for having me 